Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, can you hear me? If you can you hear me? Can you say hi? Can you use the chat box and say hi? I want to make sure that everyone hears me. Oh, good, good, good. So you're welcome today to um, our webinar. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, my name is Ayabami Adedini, and I'm Content Marketing Manager at NXS. Uh, we're doing this in collaboration with Outside International. Today, we have a topic called Co-Designing Sustainable Energy Solutions for Displaced Communities. It's, uh, it's a very great topic for us to have, particularly because of the current uh, uh, global politics going on, where we have a lot of displaced communities in Africa, Nigeria, uh, DRC, India, and every other part of the world. But before we go in, uh, I'd like to just people to use uh, the chat box and tell us where you're uh, watching this from. Like I see someone from Nigeria. Hi, Humar. Glad to have you here. So you just use the chat box and just let me know where you're watching from. And uh, to give us an idea of where our audience uh, is uh, watching from, okay? We are from Scotland. We are from Italy. Good, good, good. Good, we are from Somalia. Of course, we are from Nigeria, Mozambique. Great, great, great. Okay, so before we delve into it proper, um, I'd like you to, like I said, make use uh, of the chat box, choose yourself, you can connect also because uh, aside us learning some new things from experts today, we also use this opportunity to network uh, among ourselves. Uh, today we have three experts who are gonna be speaking to this topic. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce one, to, to introduce them. Uh, first, I'm gonna be introducing uh, Vivian Bernier, who is the CEO of the NAccess Foundation. Vivian is going to be giving us some um, ideas about what the NXS Foundation is, uh, what, what it does, and why this uh, webinar is holding today. Uh, we also have among uh, our panelists today, Joel, Joel Hangi, and then subsequently, uh, we also have uh, Ben Robinson from Outside International. So once again, I'd just like us to know that this webinar is held in collaboration with Outside International. Okay, so let's just uh, go straight into the webinar. Yeah, we have someone from, from the UK, from Mozambique. Good, good, good. All right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome Vivian Bernier, the CEO of the NXS Foundation, uh, who's gonna be uh, taking over from now. Hello, thank you, Ayubami. And uh, thank you, audience uh, that has joined, uh, over 30 people from different places of uh, the world, as far as they can see, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm uh, presenting shortly the agenda. We will uh, be on the welcome round, that's where we are right now. Then we will jump into a deep dive, which uh, Ben will walk us through on the co-design toolbox, which uh, we have supported development and outside international and the lead of Ben has developed. And then we will have a discussion about co-design in energy access settings for humanitarian situations, so mainly for displaced persons. And uh, we will also have time for your questions. So whenever you have questions, post them in the chat and we will try to address all of them at the end. Otherwise, I'm try to follow up afterwards. Um, so just a few words on myself. I'm uh, Vivian. I'm, I've worked in the energy access space, not particularly for displaced communities or humanitarian settings, but rather in remote areas, which are not electrified yet, mainly focusing on mini grids, but yeah, recently also doing more other types of um, like solar home systems, standalone systems. Uh, with an access, we uh, promote open source solutions because we believe uh, to achieve universal access to energy requires a lot of efforts. However, a lot of other companies and organizations and people committed to that find themselves ending up doing a lot of R&D efforts, while a lot of these R&D efforts are repetitive 
and very often reinventing the wheel and not core to the to actually getting more people connected. So they are necessary, but they are not necessary that they are done like 10 times or 15 times or 20 times or 100 times. So a lot of this should be done once or twice maximum and, and shared. And then there should be an ecosystem of little adaptations and modifications to it for the particular settings. And to do so, we support tools that are missing. Uh, this can be software, hardware, or also platforms, knowledge platforms like this ones that help co-design approaches in energy access and particular energy access for humanitarian settings in that case. Um, so we, we help the support, the development and the adoption. Then we also create a repository of high quality open source tools that can be accessed and used by anyone and help the promotion of those tools so that the people in the sector know about them and also generally promote um, open source and collaborative approaches in the sector. Um, that was short on me on, on what NXS does. Let me uh, introduce Joel. Joel, please um, introduce yourself for a minute. You are muted, Joel. Oh, sorry, I'm um, apologies for that. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Joel Hangi. Um, I'm joining you from the GPA, the, which is the platform uh, for humanitarian energy access and, uh, and pro provision of um, uh, energy access in different settings. It's a platform that um, uh, coordinates um, uh, all operations when it comes to energy in displacement settings. Uh, and I work as the inclusivity lead there. And it's it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this conversation as, um, of course, a person with this specific background, but again, uh, someone who has really uh, worked uh, for some times in this settings, ensuring like access to energy. It's, it's not uh, a luxury, but uh, something that can be considered as um, human rights and displaced people can also be, uh, can have access to it. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's my cue. Um, hi everyone uh, out there in the virtual world. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Robinson. I am yeah, an energy expert who's worked across 30 countries um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia over the last 10 years on various dimensions of um, energy access projects from the development and humanitarian sectors. Um, this, as Vivian mentioned earlier, is it's kind of my brainchild, this project, and um, we are uh, running it through Outside International, and Outside International, for you who don't know, uh, is a small innovation consultancy based in Switzerland, where we provide sort of strategic support to the humanitarian sector across the energy access, uh, health, and uh, drones for development sectors. Um, so yeah, that's us. It's great to uh, be here, and thanks NXS for the opportunity to speak more. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ben. And I think that's the moment for you, Ben, also to walk us through in more detail about this co-design toolbox so that people can get a uh, better understanding what it is actually, what we are talking about. And so you will be well enhanced with Ben for the next roughly 20 minutes. And then you will see uh, Joel and myself again and we will have a couple of questions and discussions uh, between us uh, because I'm, yeah, I'm excited to learn more, even though I know the project now for one and a half years or even longer. Uh, but yeah, everybody in the audience, uh, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, we will try to address as much of them at the end. So the stage is yours, Ben, and enjoy. Enjoy, yeah. I. 
<laughs> she don't love these speaking events to lots of people, but uh, yeah, it's nicer uh, online. It um, definitely makes me less nervous. So yeah, uh, hi everyone. And um, yeah, thank you again, Nexus, for providing this platform. Sorry if I'm looking down a lot, my notes are below my laptop. Um, so yeah, this project really, as I said before, is my um, brainchild. And so the intention in the next 20 minutes is to do three key things. Um, first, to outline our approach and concept of co-design within the humanitarian energy sector. Second is to discuss, obviously, the key features of the toolbox. This includes our backend data side, our visual presentation layer, and what you see currently shared on your screen, which is our uh, Miro board that is the central resource for the sort of toolkit and accompanying resources. And finally, within this Miro board, I, I want to just showcase the potential benefits of using this toolbox um, for practitioners and some activities we've designed to make it all a, a little bit easier um, for you. I think what I would say at the onset is that this toolbox doesn't reinvent the wheel. What we've done here is created a curated space for people to be able to access information more effectively. Um, and so just keep that in the, in the back of your mind. The second thing I'd like to say as I open is what makes this presentation kind of especially good for me is that we can use this resource to present the toolbox. And, um, and also uh, you can use it in your own organizations to present it as well. Remember, everything here is open source. So I will post the link actually to the mirror in the chat so you can all have a, a look around whilst I'm talking. Um, and so, yeah, welcome to our mirror board. Uh, what you can see, this is the central resource for practitioners and other energy access professionals working in this space to both learn um, and navigate our toolbox as well as help to deploy it within the, their own organization. And so this can be used both as a self journey learning or as an institutional framework for learning. Um, it's essentially a template for all you people listening to modify and use as you feel fit. We, we don't own any of this, this is all open source. I'm gonna say that a few times um, during this, this, this talk. So let's start with a quick overview of the structure. So first the content goes from left to right. Um, the yellow boxes you see at the top of the page, so for example, opening background information, humanitarian energy code and toolbox, these are the key groups of information. And so going from left to right, first, we have an introduction for all of you who are new to Miro. I know it's not uh, used that widely, and so we felt it was important to, to have a, a quick introduction. Um, second is a template for all of you to um, uh, present this within your organizations, opening slides, agenda, a, a check-in activity. Next, um, we have the background information on the toolbox, which we'll run through in more detail in a second. And then some theoretical grounding of, of what it me of what co-design means um, within the humanitarian energy space. Next, moving along, we have the overview of the toolbox itself, its key components, um, as well as activities, if you scroll down, uh, on how to well, understand if you know what the toolbox is about and how to use it um, effectively. If we jump across one more column, we have our co-design templates, and these include um, the IOM DTM tool, Mercy Corpses, inclusive energy training, and also a number of qualitative research templates that we put together. I, this obviously is not an extensive list of everything that exists out there. It's just what we felt were a few good examples that we could then follow up into real world project case studies. And so we have in the next column, a number of project case studies that leverage these tools um, in real world actionable ways. Um, and it's, I guess it's, yeah, it's worth noting that we have selected these as like best case examples, but there are many, many more, and we hope people will add more information into this as it, as it evolves. Um, in addition, we have also a number of activities in these two sections that uh, allow you to understand how you might use these co-design templates within your organizations, but also how, what are the relevant case studies, what were learnings from these case studies that you can also 
implement. And then in this final column, we have a closing template so that you can, as all good temp workshops should have, uh, a checkout session. And so essentially what we've created here is a half to a full day workshop um, that can be tailored to any organization's needs um, that can both be used as a individual self-learning tool and a yes, institutional like learning framework. One final port, point on structure before we jump into more of the content is that on each slide, you'll see there's three sort of sections to each slide. On the left is facilitator notes and additional information. In the center is the slide itself with uh, the information <laughs> on that slide. And on the right is a number of key resources um, with click out links. And yes, I already hear you thinking through the screen, wow, that's a lot of text. But just remember here, we're trying to balance a resource that can be both a self-taught module and, as I said, institutional learning framework. And again, it's also open source, so you can have a copy of it and you can tailor it to your own needs. So let's talk a bit about humanitarian energy first, a bit of background information. So I think we're all here because we're interested in this space. And um, we created a, a well, a definition for co-design below, but you, we use the definition um, from uh, Sarah Rosenberg and uh, Hajar Kadu's work from a few years ago, which I think is a is a the foundational definition that most of us use for the sector. But essentially, what we're talking about in this is how we design energy programs in both onset and prote protracted humanitarian responses. Um, and the idea with this work is to make that process slightly more effective. We have. I've um, gone on a bit of a, a journey of realization through my own career and outside together that we really need as a sector to step past technical tools and approaches and dive deep into this complex contextual environment that is often far away from the project designer's own experience. Um, and that often this complex contextual environment is what determines the sustainability, longevity and success of humanitarian responses. Um, and ultimately uh, connecting them into the world of development. So just on a, uh, what is energy within humanitarian settings? Well, it cuts across many um, sectors and areas, not only cooking, cooling, lighting and heating at the household level, but many more sectors and many different scales, be they institutional, regional, national, um, or even uh, exists uh, connected to humanitarian infrastructure or, or any other part. Energy cuts across all parts of the humanitarian space. And so with this toolbox, we're trying to initiate change within the sector. And so we put together, a, let's call it theory of change, although I don't like that fundamental of change maybe is, 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 is better. And it sort of goes like this, change, change occurs for us through individual champions having knowledge. Ideally, they, are, they have experience of forced displacement. Um, that then waterfalls into evolving organizational processes that can empower people to make decisions about their own energy lives. And that then can, again, try and change the needle on the systemic practices within the sector. The humanitarian energy sector is quite new as a thematic programmatic area and so there is the possibility to change the humanitarian system to um, increase the effectiveness of the response so let's jump down onto co-design um, as you can see on this slide we put together a, a, a sort of agreed upon definition for this project um, it's built on earlier work with coventry university and the heave project as does most of the theoretical side of this project, that's where this idea of how do we categorize and operationalize co-design in a more effective way um, comes from. And so a key component of that, and a component that sits through the whole toolbox is this idea of the spectrum of co-design. And I, again, I know the text is quite small on this slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you chat speaky through it, or you can, again, click on the mirror link that I dropped in the chat. And so 
The spectrum of co-design is a method to start the process of connecting all of these buzzwords and definitions that are often associated with this sort of big topic area, be it participation, inclusive, inclusion, locally led response, capacity building, and decolonization. We've tried to fit them across this spectrum to make them more easily applicable on the operational side. So on the left, we have where some of the technical tools um, sit, which would be a process in which we call it contextually disconnected design or designing in a, the a theoretically imagined reality, I think is a, is a really nice way of putting it. That is disconnected from the context in which you are designing the MTD programs for. And then on the right, we have this thing called transfor transformational knowledge exchange, which is a new approach to um, designing programs that looks to yeah, decolonize um, and include people in a way that their voices can have real power and make real change within their own sort of energy lives and energy futures. And so this enables us to place projects on, on this, this scale, on this sort of scale. And across the next four slides, which I'm actually not going to go into because there's lots of detail and we don't have so much time, um, there is uh, operational questions that allow you to understand where projects might fit and how you can then level up. So, let me check the time. Okay, we're doing good. On to the humanitarian energy co-design toolbox itself. So we've talked quite, so I've talked quite a lot about the theory. Um, and now let's talk about the toolbox. What's in the toolbox? How can I use it? Who's it for? How can I access it? All of those questions will be answered. And so as I've said a few times already, what we are doing with this toolbox is operationalizing these four levels of co-design and allowing practitioners and wider energy access professionals to understand where their projects fit and how and what they can do to, as I said, level up their projects. For example, Someone thinks, oh, my project sits in this level one. What can I do to ensure it's more inclusive and participatory? The toolbox provides information that answers this question. Or you think, uh, what systems can we co-create together to decolonize existing humanitarian practices to result in a more localized energy response? Buzzword, 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 what does that mean? Okay, the toolbox provides you the resources to understand how you can actively operationalize those um, terms. And I mean, I think it's probably also worth mentioning that co-design practices and practices in general in the humanitarian energy sector are quite fragmented. Um, and we see a lot of pilots and what we actually need to see is scale. And so by creating this resource for people to use, we hope that we aren't repeating both mistakes and pilots so that we can all start doing things at larger scales, um, especially as I said earlier that the humanitarian energy needs are only increasing as we as we get further and further on. So to be more concise, our purpose, operationalizing co-design through a centralized and coordinated series of resources. Our pathway is that fundamentals of change, individual champions, evolving organizational processes, proofing the wider system. And our intended audience, if I scroll down to this next slide, is humanitarian practitioners and energy access professionals. At Outside, we work primarily or majority of the time within the humanitarian sector, but we also realize that there's that, that the humanitarian and development space are fundamentally linked and that there is significant benefit to what the wider space using this as well. So after all this, what is in the toolbox? So there are three key components to this. Um, we have a data layer, which is the collection of key themes, toolkits, quality standards, methods, case studies that sits in the back end. It's currently hosted on a Zotero library that you can access using the link in the yellow box just here, as well as a how-to guide on how to navigate and add information into that. We have a systems map, which is a visual representation of all of that data that you can click through and select. Um, and then we have the training pack, including what's on this mirror, um, and we also have another how-to guide on how to uh, navigate that. And so uh, I think it's worth noting at this point, before I talk about these three things in detail, is that 
I would like to thank the project team, my project team that worked on this um, and all of the time that they dedicated to the project. I see some of them are on the call and um, it was, it's a really meaningful project and I really appreciate all of that effort. It, that feels like a break for a sponsor, but I think it's a really important thing to mention. So the data layer in detail. Um, it's at this link, so you can all go and click this link now in the Miro and go and have a look around, as well as clicking the link onto the, the how-to guide. And so this layer, as I said, is divided into a number of sections. It talks about basic resources. So these is, this is key information that we think is really important in a number of topic areas. Advanced resources, this is for people who are interested in diving more deeply into this topic area that are maybe looking to connect, say, theory of behavior change models with inclusive programming um, in humanitarian settings. Um, we also talk about tools, um, basic tools, so understanding how you get information effectively and in an equitable way, um, including, as it says there, field guides and a few theoretical explanations. The advanced tools, similar to the advanced resources, are for people who really want to dive in deep into the theory of like participatory and inclusive programming. And finally, we have a number of toolkits. And there are many toolkits out here that aid with this work, but we've curated a number of quantitative and qualitative tools that we think um, can really sort of enhance um, projects. And so the presentation layer is, in effect, a visualization of all of that data. Here's a quick screenshot. And so our presentation layer does three things. It's a visual representation. It's an easy, easy method for navigating the com complex resources and um, managing what information you see. And it also can be a training tool because if you see here, I know the text is small. We have two distinct sections to this. The top uh, layer above the dotted line is your selection menu. So as you see, the resources and tools buttons here, the level of co-design in the middle, and then you can also further refine through the step in the co-design journey that you're wanting to focus on. Um, and as you click all of these different resources, you can, it will generate different outputs below in this box here. Um, the link to this tool is here as well. And so on to my last slide, and that is the training pack. So all of this is contained in the training pack. That includes uh, background information on humanitarian energy and co-design and the intersection between the two. It includes all of those um, how-to guides. It includes um, a training pack how-to guide, which coordinates all of the resources um, that are listed here and more. And we also have a number of additional case study examples, uh, co-design templates, and then the slides, facilitator notes you see on the left-hand side here and key resources, they're all contained in that. And if you don't like Miro, um, it's all uh, contained in an offline pack as well. So you don't uh, have to even engage with Miro if you don't want to. Uh, so yeah, I think that's pretty much where I'm gonna wrap up. I would say that fine, the final thing I would say is that we are really interested in improving this as a tool. And um, we'd be really interested to hear your uh, thoughts, suggestions, questions, and everything else. So I think I am bang on 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Vivian. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, this uh, was great. And also great to, I mean, I've seen this tool several times in different shapes. Had this, like very intense um, walkthrough. Yeah, exactly. I was to invite Joel. Great that you're coming on stage, because now I would like us, the three of us, to deep dive, like take this deep dive to uh, identify a few questions, follow ups. Um, yeah, and um, my my first question is to you, Ben, and maybe also to Joel. I don't know how much you have interacted with the toolbox already. If now somebody who says, uh, I know about energy access, well, I actually have one no clue about co-design and displaced communities is also not what I've worked with. What would you suggest as a first thing to 
in like knowing that this toolbox exists, saying, okay, what would you do to approach the topic to, I mean, you have to th learn two things, no co-design <laughs> in general as a concept and the different conditions from a remote village uh, to actually uh, like displacement setting. So what are the like general, how, what is the difference and looking at the toolbox, what would you suggest as an like, first step to to go into the toolbox which provides a lot of different resources um yeah i stop here yeah I, I can jump in with this one i think um the nice thing about the toolbox is is this self learning journey and so there is this fundamentals of uh humanitarian energy co-design document that exists um it's linked all over the mirror board um, and so that would be a nice place to get a summarized version of what those two topic areas are. I think the second thing to say would be if that wasn't enough for you, then the GPA has lots of resources, including the sort of fundamental, what is the humanitarian energy space resource um, that uh, I think uh, would be the other place to go. But I would also invite Joelle to talk a bit more about their inclusivity programming, which I think I'd, would be another sort of route into this uh, like collective or collaborative design space. Yeah, sure. Thank you, um, Ben. Of course, that's, that's really a great uh, question in terms of ensuring like this useful tool can be utilized and maximized after putting a lot of energy and, and resources into it. Um, basically, I think one of the things that I mentioned before, Dave, ex Briefly speaking about um, the inclusivity projects, uh, which is transforming humanitarian energy uh, access to your projects. Um, so basically speaking of how to ensure people can know about the tool and get to you know start using the tool. First of all, it's important to as the developer and the team behind uh, you know um, developing this tool. First of all, it's really important to have in place um, uh, an awareness or outreach um, strategy in place, ensuring like people can definitely get to know this. In as much as humanitarian sector is, it's it's really something that is small, but it's, it's really growing and growing very fast. Uh, and it's really important um, to make sure that um, those who are really, you know, are acting or doing projects um, in the space can also get to to know about this. So, one of the space, as as Ben mentioned, is the 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 GPA, which is the Global Platform for Action. So it really brings all the actors together, including donors, um, actors, um, and to some extent uh, even displaced people themselves um, to get to know what is happening in the sector how are the things that um, are taking place can also be improved with this kind of um, collaborative approach. So that's really something that I, I can mention. And Ben mentioned like there is an option for the tool to be accessed offline. That's also another layer to take into consideration. Please correct me, Ben, if I'm wrong, but I think you mentioned something like that. Uh, so basically, that's also something great um, to, to have in place because Let's say, for example, if you're targeting, and of course, the humanitarian space, most of the time, you'll find that they're operating in very rural or remote areas where access to you know, um, connectivity, internet is really low. So it's really important to ensure that those who are working in the field also have access to that whenever they want it. So um, accessing it offline, it's really, really important. But aside from that, I think a continuous support from the technical, people it's really some something to you know continue doing i am not i think i'll definitely tell everyone that this one hour call or 30 minute chat will definitely not be enough to say we are done we have developed the tool is there and let everyone start using it so we definitely need more series of you know awareness and let people know about this now speaking of the um inclusivity projects that i mentioned it's um it's a project that started um sometimes back um more than a year and it's really uh going to second kind of second phase of it um to ensure that we are just getting to the place where we want the sector to be in terms of being inclusive um and when we are speaking of inclusion uh there are always this kind of um uh, question that we we always um ask ourselves because uh 
let's say, bringing this new approach in a sector or in a space that has been um, um, having this top-down approach. Uh, and people have been, um, you know, um, I think put in a space where they somehow um, directly or indirectly um, they have been uh, they have become independent um, because they know that there is a tool that will be developed somewhere with you know a group of engineers will sit somewhere and they'll bring a solution a ready-made solution and it's just for us to use it um, unfortunately that has been a, uh, the case and and I appreciate the tool uh, in, in this tool that we are talking about now uh, but the fact that it's really breaking, uh, the different stages that um, we'll find in the we'll definitely find in the humanitarian space in terms of from nothing as consultation, nothing as understanding the, the the context and developing a solution to starting understanding the context, starting um, engaging the people, and not just engaging but let people also be part of the design of the solution that will definitely fit their needs. So that's that's the aim of the project itself, ensuring like. Uh, displaced persons are not just considered as, um, let's say, end users or when, when it comes to tools or, uh, you know, everything that can be given to them. But again, they're also uh, considered as people who can contribute to the, the solution. So they're not just sitting and waiting for the solution, but they're also contributors. And the fact that they understand best the, the, the situation, then they are well placed to bring something that will definitely, um, let's say, uh, when it comes to sustainability, it's something that will make sense because they understand the context best. So this is the objective of the project. Uh, this is how we are trying to approach it, generally speaking, by making sure that we start from the top because we know if we manage to change the top. And when I speak, I, I talk about the top, I mean donors, I mean the donor community, the, the humanitarian practitioners, those who have been used for so long um, using this top-down down approach to start changing the approach and understand that this change is, is definitely something that is benefiting the sector. And that's one thing that I've always mentioned is like the sector and the, the practitioner should definitely find themselves more and more irrelevant to see the impact. Because if they continue seeing themselves very relevant and always needed, then there is that need to change what is happening because people have been uh, trapped in that circle of, um, of dependency and other people are there always to give the solution. So yeah, maybe just to highlight a little bit of that question, that's what I can share. Thank you. Thank you, Joel and Ben. That was a, a massive rundown on, on, on the whole thing. You actually covered already two other questions that I would have, Joel, uh, but that's great. So I don't even have to ask them and already had the answers. I mean, particularly this um, challenges no, on, on the top-down approaches that, um, I mean, that we face because that's how it's done today. Uh, let's, I mean, let's be honest. And in, in most cases, obviously, there are initiatives like GPA and others that push more and more these uh, approaches. But yeah, and, and the, the common, the most co uh, common way and traditional way of doing it is is this top-down approach. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm happy you highlighted that. And f for me, um, I would like to to know a bit more on a bit independent from the tool maybe uh, and from the programs more, um, I mean, from the from the TR program, from GPA and also from the toolbox. I mean, but if you see elements that contribute to that, happy to relate to them. But uh, the question is, how do you, do you see generally strategy to position um, co-design or place co-design approaches more popular in the implementation? I mean, what are the challenges to do so, but also which opportunities do you see? Which are the entry points likely a toolbox like that is an entry point, but also like beyond that, what are the strategies we need to, to get these co-design approaches more integrated in the, in the current practices? And which opportunities do you see and which challenges do you see for it? Um, yeah, that's a question to both of you and happy to hear your thoughts. Um, I mean, you can go ahead then, happy to you sure? Okay. <laughs> Um, I think there's, yeah, like community design or, or co-design is, is, is not a new phenomenon and it's something that has existed since, um, yeah, since like community-led approaches in the wash sector in the 80s. Um, 
but I think that in terms of challenges of embedding them meaningfully within the sector, um, it, it goes a bit to what Joel said earlier about these top-down approaches that it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, we'd love to do this, but it's another thing to actually do it. Um, and so obviously the toolbox sort of helps you in that in that regard and solves one of those like what does it mean when I say participation or inclusion or any of these terms that um, as per the definition of this project like sit within this big collaborative process um, uh, but there are exam there are examples of people doing it effectively already um, there are exam and that's why again bring it back to the toolkit <laughs> that they that there are examples within the toolkit of people that are, are doing those effectively which highlight challenges in, in terms of specific challenges of code like implementing co-design in whatever like subtopic you want to implement it it's so also contextually specific that white dudes sitting in germany i don't have the knowledge to say okay if we implement a code co-design program within in i don't know Malakal refugee camp in South Sudan. Um, what would be the challenges of doing that? Because I'm so far away from the context, that's not sort of my like that's not my place to say. But what I could say is that donors don't like co-design programs because they put the power into the hands of the people that can make decisions to shape their own futures, which is not a way that many donors like uh, like being not in control, right? Donors like to be in control of their money, which in some cases is justifiable, but in others is, is not, especially if the program outcomes aren't as good. Um, but I realize I'm waffling, so uh, I'm going to hand over to Joel. I think that was the main things I wanted to mention. Uh, thank you, Ben. That was a great, uh, let's say, introduction to what I really wanted to also share. Um, yeah, I think speaking of the, the challenges, um, we have highlighted a few. And just, just to emphasize, of course, that's that um, top-down approach, um, colonial approach. Um, it's really something that comes with um, one thing that we'll definitely not, um, we can't, um, let's say, uh, forget to highlight when it comes to this conversation is power. Um, so the fact that donor holds money, they, they, they also come with that um, power. So there is that power imbalance that we often see uh, when it comes to co-designing, when it comes to collaborating, when it comes to engagement. Um, so to some extent we find in as much as we are engaging, in as much as we are all sitting around one table, we definitely feel like the power in the room is not really <laughs> the same. Um, and that's really something that uh, we always um, have to question. Um, do we, like, when it comes to inclusion, of course, um, like representation, we can talk about everyone being there and we have this uh, rate of representation. Um, but when it comes to inclusion, it's like now the power dynamics. Um, do you think a donor or a country donor um, like suggestion will, to, is likely to be rejected because a displaced person say this is not relevant? Um, so probably not. Um, so that's really something that we have to mention like power. Um, and then the other thing is costs and, and time that uh, co-design, I mean, co-designing approach also comes with because when it comes to like, let's say, a group of people like with the same uh, mind, with the same approach, with the same background, sitting together like engineers, they will definitely uh, speak the same language. It's much easier to develop a solution uh, than bringing someone who doesn't really have those kind of qualification and comes with something else. So that's really something that will cost time, will cost money. Uh, but again, when we speak of money and time, it's also important to look at uh, other things such as the value for money. Like, what is the what is the end goal of of the the, the project itself? Um, and that's where we also again have to question where do we have to stand as as people, knowing that on one hand we have those who have power, on the other hand we have those who are not really uh, so powerful, but they have 
let's say, skills, they have contribution or insight that can be really, really useful. And if we are working, if we, the approach and the objective is to work towards ensuring their needs is, is at the center, then we have to accept and give up on our power, which is like, like touching people's interests. Like to some extent, some people power is really the only tool they hold and that's the only thing they use. So if you try to balance that, then it's really something that is, it's touching people's interests. And to some extent, we also even have, let's say, projects that are taking place in this uh, space, like this place context, this displacement context, and you find like it has some underlining motivations behind. Like they have either they're testing something else. It's really not something that is looking towards ensuring that development of that space um, per se. So that's also something to to mention. And as Ben um, started mentioning earlier, like the culture and the fact that each uh, each displacement context has its own um, challenge. It, it has it needs its own kind of approach. That means you can't really replicate a solution easily and 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 being 100% like it's something that will work. So you have always to ensure that you tell you have a tailored solution. Um, and again, it's it goes back to time and, and, and I mean resources. But again, speaking of the opportunities, I think the approach brings a lot of opportunities such as the, the sustainab sustainability of the projects, um, ensuring like the, the, the local capacity is well utilized, like the resources that are available at the local level. It's also something that people can tap into and utilize. Even speaking of human resources, that's already enough for people to utilize and build on something um, and, and make sure that people have that autonomy and a sense of you know, ownership when it comes to our projects. Yeah, thank you. Cool, thanks. Would, uh, yeah, would, go ahead. If you have one more thing, would, please brief because we have yeah, a lot would, of questions. <laughs> I would just add an, ask, add an asterisk actually. And I, and I know this discussion started with donors bad um, and that's not actually the, the case. Um, there are donors, there are organizations, take Start Network, take Response Innovation Lab, take Innovation Norway, take IKEA Foundation, there are organizations that are doing things differently and trying to implement these approaches and being successful with them. Um, the sector is a very different place as to what it was five or 10 years ago. And so for those people to link it back to the beginning who are interested in being involved in this space, there's lots of things you can read about success stories. The challenge comes is how exactly what Joel said there at the end, how you transform this collaborative process from being applicable at one in one space to being something that has the ability to be scaled across the, what is the number now, 110, 120 forcibly displaced million people. Hmm. Um, and that's the real challenge. And that is something that I think the toolbox doesn't answer that challenge, but it provides the tools and links to people that are thinking about it in a meaningful way. So I thought that was important. I couldn't just let the donors bad comment go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good, Ben. I, I, um, Totally appreciate. I, I would have come back to that also to give you the chance to <laughs> rectify, um, even though I mean a critics is good and important, but yeah, I, I understand that it, it needs to be uh, put in in context. Um, so thank you for that. Um, just as a general comment, we have a lot of questions, or I still have a lot of questions I would like to discuss, and we have only one question from the audience so far, which is. Okay, if you want to have more questions, post them. So I, I will take a couple of minutes more to discuss one or two questions more that I have and then address the one question we have in the chat and then wrap up. Um, yeah, let's try to be brief. Um, I will try to be brief asking and also answering so we can uh, answer possibly two more questions. Um, the, the one that I have, I know, and that's actually something I think has not been much mentioned in the development of the co-design toolkit, there were actually it was inclusive itself. It had people in displaced settings being part of the process of the research of informing it and creating it. So I think that's something important to mention. Um, the, 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 the development of the code design itself was an inclusive process. So um, just the, the one question on how do you think, I mean, there are two questions. One, how could people in displaced settings know about the toolkit? And is this also beneficial to them? Is this actually a toolkit that includes resources that might help them to get their voice more outside? It possibly doesn't need to. Um, 
but possibly also has some resources or some ways that it can help the people itself to, yeah, it shows them ways to get their voice better heard. Possibly not, it would be okay, but yeah, wanted to know if there, there is ways. As I said, let's try to be brief so we can have one more other question. Um, yeah, so I think where it adds value is with refugee -led or forcibly displaced led um, businesses who are looking to connect to um, like the, the global donor world. And I know that uh, it happens through people like Ashton Climate, um, but there is, I think the toolbox is useful for people who are wanting to engage with this donor world um, and to leverage resources from them and speak the same language. And yeah, as, as um, Joel said earlier, to like connect, to find a point of connection, I think that's really helpful. In terms of for individuals as a knowledge resource, if you're interested in building your own energy project, uh, yeah, I think it's great. But uh, beyond that, I, I don't know. I think you would need to be part of a humanitarian response or at least have the ability to implement some kind of program, whether through a yeah, forcibly displaced led business or other um, for it to have real use. Otherwise, it's just interesting knowledge. Cool. I don't, do you have anything to add, Joel? Otherwise, I would jump to the next question. Okay, cool. Then I have a, a more general philosophical question, possibly, and I guess we could do a whole webinar about that. It's, um, I mean, the whole world talks about data-driven decision, AI, all that. So I would like to know your opinion, if you are willing to <laughs> share it, on how this relates, contradicts, could be of benefit or actually is in contradiction of inclusive and co-design approaches. Um, I mean, I know it's not an easy question, um, but I, yeah, it actually came across my head while we are talking and I think it's an important thing. I mean, I have a position here, but I am happy to hear your first and you don't have to have a very extensive response. We anyway doesn't have, do have much more time, but if you have some thoughts, opinions, happy to, to hear them here. Uh, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think if I have much to say on that, but maybe just a quick comment. Uh, I, I know that, the, of course, the uh, artificial intelligence is really uh, taking the, the world to another level, um, which is good depending on how people, how you're approaching it, and we, you can get a lot of resources from there. But again, it's still something that I still questionable in terms of accuracy or in terms of reliance. Like if you are really uh, someone who's really looking at getting the real sense of things, of course you can, that can be a starting point. But um, I think when it comes to displacement settings, one thing that I always encourage people, especially those who are really interested into, you know, knowing more or bringing solutions or helping or supporting whatever is happening in the, those spaces is to ensure like they have that tangible connection um, because just beyond uh, let's say reports beyond all the things that we can be able to read there is always that difference when you get there for the first time second time and it's always new um, because when you get there like it's it's a tour it's whatever you're going to visit a project after five years down the line you find things have massively changed. So it's really important to get and see the reality and learn from that. And that's why I think we are really encouraging this collaborative approach, knowing that it's comes with a lot of uh, demand um, and it needs a lot of flexibility. But again, if we have to get into the sense of what is happening, I think we, you can't just rely on what you can get online sitting from your computer somewhere else and not really go to that extent of extent of visiting the place interacting with people connect to the reality on the ground yeah thank you thank you ben you have 30 seconds <laughs> yeah it's an interesting question um and it, at outside we work on another program that looks to leverage ai to increase the effectiveness of humanitarian operations and um does it have a place in co-design in like in the in the approach i think no on a granular level no on a global level sorting massive amounts of data if we ever get to a point where we have 
like up to date real world contextual data then yes um like for example what mercicops is doing with nightlight um uh, to just drop another project name in and give no context um i think they're identifying where there is need on a global level maybe maybe but as you all said nothing replaces the all of the soft things that come out of an interaction with someone um yeah yeah i'm um, yeah thank you it's i mean it's more or less what i expected maybe to hear or so, so, i mean and, and might share this position as well and say like i mean AI and data driven decision are just as good as the data you have. And there are things where we can't get the data yet. And, um, or maybe we won't ever. That's also something, a philosophical decision. But yeah, we need to be aware of that. And um, that's also a risk, actually, because if you rely too much on, on it, it only reflects the data that you're able to collect and excludes naturally the data you can't collect like this lift spaces and all that. Um, yeah, we have three more minutes and we have one question which I would like to address, um, which is asked by Jaroslava. There's a, uh, exist durable materials to, pro uh, to protect industry machinery against extreme temperature and chemicals, for instance, silicon. Have you heard about any innovative solution to protect energy infrastructure from heavy mechanical damage like shelling? Yeah, our times re definitely require such technologies. I would agree. Um, as we have very short time, my very short answer to that would be, I mean, I'm engineer and that's definitely not a co-design answer would be like bunkers or stuff like that but i'm yeah i'm not expert in humanitarian settings or in war zones luckily and so this is my answer i don't know if the, the, the two of you that have a bit more experience in the space can give maybe a like 20 to 30 seconds answer to that i would i would add one thing and it's not going to directly answer your question i'm sorry but it is that uh, programming within the humanitarian energy space tends to focus more on protracted set settings and not on onset response. Um, onset response is still dominated by diesel generators and tracking diesel everywhere. Um, and so in that case, the cost of protecting your like rapid response energy infrastructure is much more than just buying a new generator. Um, I imagine, but there are there is one new working group um, at NRC looking on onset response, so I would maybe recommend you reach out to them. Good. Joel, do you have anything to add? No, nothing. Thank you, Ben, for that response. Okay, then let me wrap up here. Um, and for wrapping up, I'm muting myself. That's not smart. Um, I, it was great, very insightful for me. Thank you for discussion and sorry for um, bringing this other question about AI and data, but it was really striking me where we are talking and it's all around. And I, I think it's always important to put it um, in context. Um, so, and, and one thing just for everybody, this thing has been developed by Outside International with the support of NXS, but it's available online and NXS is committed to make it livable and better. And I mean, there's a presentation layer, you know, it's working, it's functional, it might not have the nicest design yet, but we are always looking to improve and we are also inviting people to contribute, provide feedback directly to us, to the email addresses you have down there for NXS directly or to reach out to Ben or to Joel. And or also, yeah, here in the chat, uh, we also have a Discord community, which you can join. Um, always happy to get more people. Also provide negative feedback, that's all good, because then we can improve, not only oh, it's all great. So happy to hear your opinions and people that want to support us, um, financially, obviously, but also a lot of people with know-how, maybe people from the place settings that want to have her, their voice better heard and included in the toolbox, more than welcome. Let us know and we will try to do our best. Um, that's it from my side. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, it was great having you. And I wish all a good afternoon. And the recording will be shared automatically to the ones that have registered. And yeah, that's it. Have a good afternoon.
or morning, wherever you are placed in the world, <laughs> or night. Bye-bye. <laughs>